Good afternoon, my name is Dave Norton from Discovering New England History, and this is going to be episode two of the Italian campaign in World War II. And of course, uh, if you're in the United States here now, everyone's got an uncle or father or grandfather or somebody that fought either in the European campaign or the Pacific campaign back during uh, World War II. So this is a uh, New England story as well as a, a total American story. So we'll begin with the first slide. And once again, this is dedicated to the uh, four soldiers from Seekonk, Massachusetts that were killed in the Italian campaign. And we're gonna cover in detail um, everything about from Naples to Casino to Anzio. It's an area of World War II that you don't see too much of. And we're gonna go into uh, great detail so you can appreciate what these soldiers went through. So we'll go to the next slide. And we also have, uh, we're telling the story through my father, who was Sergeant Norton in World War II, through his letters that he wrote home. And also uh, the story is gonna be t told through the eyes of those that uh, served with him and an anti-aircraft gun crew, the all New England anti-aircraft gun crew. So we'll go to the next slide. And here's a letter now. They're still on their way to uh, Casino. They left Naples, they're on their way to Casino. And of course, all the way up the road there, they're being hit by the Luftwaffe and bombed and strafed and everything else. And of course, you can see some of the devastation over there in the picture on the, um, on the right. And here's a letter I'm gonna to read to you, one of his letters here. Here it is, almost Christmas, we are still fighting with a determined German army that just doesn't know when they have had enough. They keep coming back for more punishment and we are just the ones that give it out. War is hell, and I mean every word of it, signed Sergeant Norton. That was one of the letters he sent back. Then remember, there was censorship back then. You could only send, say too much. And, um, but if you read those letters and put it in context, uh, they mean a lot. And we'll go to the next slide. And this is how they spent Christmas. You can see on the uh, right there the picture of the uh, having uh, the Christmas uh, service there and they just pulled a table out from a bombed out house, set it up, and all the soldiers just stood up there and uh, that's how they celebrated uh, Christmas over in Italy. And on the left is a card, <coughs> actually it's a V-mail that my uh, father sent back to, uh, to my mother. And it's kind of interesting, it's a Christmas card they told the soldiers that in order to get it by Christmas, of course, which is December 25th, you better mail it, put it together and mail it in early. Because there's no, uh, no email, no quick way to get, get it to, uh, they have to get it by ship across the, across the Atlantic Ocean and go through the postal service. So this is interesting. If you take a look at this uh, V-mail, it's dated the 27th of October. So they basically said, you've got two months if you want anybody to receive it by Christmas. And we'll go to the next slide. Now, what are we heading for? We're heading towards Monte Cassino. And what the German army was doing, they completely devastated Naples and then they pulled back a delay action so that they could have what they call a Gustav line at Monte Cassino was the center of it. And the idea was to pull back, have delaying um, type of action there to slow up the U.S. Army, and also to give the German Army more chance to reinforce this Gustav Line. And they were bringing in troops from all over, from uh, south of France, uh, wherever. They were just heading towards uh, Italy because uh, Hitler made a decision that he's going to stop stop uh, all the forces right here at the Gustav Line. And you can see on the top of this mountain here, if you can see, um, that's where Monte Cassino is. And then on the below, uh, on below it, on the uh, if you take a look at the picture on the on the right, um, that's where the town of Cassino was below the mountain. And um, that uh, blue river there is the Rapido River that's in front of it. So we'll go to the next slide. And this is another good shot here. You can see Monte Cassino, which is the abbey up on top of the, uh, on top of the hill. Now that was a, uh, 
the walls were 100 and 150 feet high and it was 10 feet thick at the base and the um, the monks hidden in the abbey cellar and this actual uh, casino uh, goes way goes dated back to probably the uh, I think it's the uh, 500 uh, AD way back it's a uh, religious historical site but that was the center of the Gustav line and from the top of this hill and all those mountains they could see everything below it we'll go to the next slide and that's a picture the monastery on top you can see they can see the entire approach of the US Army it was an incredible uh, observation post if you will and we'll go to the next slide and that's the inside the uh, courtyard you can see it's a, it's a beautiful uh, architectural and religious uh, building but the Germans said that they never occupied it they just uh, took everything out of it all the paintings and all the relics and everything else they systematically took it all out for safekeeping uh, of course, they probably were, were never going to bring it back again, like they were, they were doing that to all the artwork in France and other places. Um, but they did that as a, um, to sort of protect this uh, uh, religious uh, shrine. We'll go to the next slide. And you can see the German paratroopers were the ones that were assigned to uh, protect Monte Cassino. And uh, they had eight, 800 German paratroopers there. They were the best trained soldiers in the entire German army. Uh, they've been on every front, they've been through everything, and they were determined to fight to the death to protect the Gustav line. We'll go to the next slide. Now, let's talk about uh, the German Luftwaffe. Now, they had an advantage here in Italy because they had all their, um, all their airfields were right there in Italy. So they could just get up in the air real quick, go over anywhere, hit the American lines, come back, fly, refuel, go back again. Whereas um, the Fifth Army did not, did not ha have that situation at all. It was difficult because they haven't uh, established uh, their airfields yet. And this is a uh, picture of the town, the quiet town in Ciampino, Italy. And that's where a large uh, German airfield was. We'll go to the next slide. And this picture was taken right there in Italy. You can see those are the Messerschmitts, the ME-109 fighter planes. A lot of these airfields were just flat, uh, flat fields with grass on them. Uh, but no problem at all for uh, the Germans to take off their fighter planes and their bombers. And the next series of slides is quite interesting. They um, uh, with technology, they, they learned how to color these, and uh, they do a terrific job. I've never seen anything like it, so we're going to just go by what, what an airfield would look like uh, over in Italy for the Luftwaffe. And here's a picture, and it's the, uh, they're loading bombs on a German Heinkel 111 bomber. And you can see the size of the bombs in front of there. And you also can see the tents in the background, where all the pilots and the maintenance crews were. And we'll go to the next slide. And this is an incredible picture. Here's a crew of a, a German bomber. And um, of course, <clears throat> the ones that are the, the, the pilot, you can see he's a second from the left because he has the, uh, the Luftwaffe badge on it and he's got a little bit of a, he's got the leather jacket on it. And the other three would be crewmen. You got radio men, you got bombardiers, uh, machine gunners, whatever. So there's the actual crew of a German bomber. We'll go to the next slide. And this is a great shot. You can see it was a, just an open field there, and you can see there's a German officer, and he's uh, checking to make sure all the mechanics are doing everything they can to keep these uh, planes flying. And we'll go to the next slide. And this picture here, I mean, it's almost like you're right there. Um, also taken in Italy, and you can see the uh, ground crew there um, preparing everything. Uh, there's the fighters all getting their maintenance. 
they were well trained, well equipped, and the ME-109 fighters were one of the better uh, fighter planes at that time in uh, World War II. And we'll go to the next slide. And this one here is a great shot here. It shows the uh, truck coming up, and of course, the, all the drums are filled with the aviation f uh, fuel. And you can see the hoses hooked up to each drum. That's how they did it. Uh, and then you can see the fellow in the middle of there. He's uh, filling up with um, air fuel. And that's what they do. They fly all day up, up straight for road, come back, get your gasoline, air, you know, fuel for the planes, and keep on going. It was quite, quite an operation. And we'll go to the next slide. And this, uh, this is an amazing picture, too. Shows him he's trying to get the, uh, <laughs> get the drum to work, uh, the pump, the fuel pump to work. And, it, and um, you can see all the planes in the background. It was quite an operation. And we'll go to the next slide. Now, during all this time, the convoy was approaching Casino. You can see the two and a half ton trucks approaching Casino. Now, what the Germans did, we had a little bit of a discussion about that. Um, when the Fifth Army left uh, Naples and they started up the road here, and of course the bombers were bombing, and uh, you know a lot of roads uh, weren't good as, as good as this section right here. They had bomb craters, they had to go around. But what the Germans did is uh, it's incredible delay in action. Typically, if a, a fighter plane would come down treetop level and start strafing all the uh, two and a half ton trucks and everything else like that, the soldiers would pull the trucks over the side of the road, get out and jump into a nearby crater for protection. Now, the Germans knew that. And what they did is um, all those craters, as the Germans withdrew, they put in mines <laughs> and filled them all with, uh, covered them all with sand so you couldn't see them. So what happens was they, the, fighter, the fighter pilots would come down, strafe the convoy, everybody would get out of the trucks, jump into the crater and set off all these mines. Um, that just gives you an idea what the forces had to go through, the 5th Airman had to go through in their approach to Casino. We'll go to the next slide. And here's, uh, you can see this happens to be a Red Cross type of thing. These convoys winding up these uh, roads uh, on the side of the mountains. Uh, they're, they're trying to, any minute now, this looks very calm like here, but any minute now, uh, the skies could open up and you could, uh, all these uh, German fighter planes would be, be streaming down. And that's what they had to do all the way up to try to get the casino. And we'll go to the next slide. Now I want to cover this here. This is the truck that uh, any aircraft uh, crew had. It was a two and a half ton truck. But the difference on here, the, the only armament they had on a convoy was a 50 caliber machine gun that's uh, on top. You can see it on the top of the truck. And what they did is they, they cut a hole in the uh, cab and the passenger side. So when the truck stopped, the driver, uh, driver's assistant there could uh, essentially stand up on the seat and you had the 50 caliber, which you can, which you can see there on the, um, on the left, the picture with, it, with a ring there, a mounting ring, so you could swivel 360 degrees and uh, fire 50 caliber machine gun bullets at any uh, strafing airplane. And um, that's what they had to do. That's the only protection they had while where you're moving a convoy. You can't set up uh, artillery or anything. That's it. So it was 50 calibers going against uh, German bombers and going against German fighter planes. And we'll go to the next slide. I happen to like this picture here. We're going to go through uh, something that, uh, this is a true story that my father told me. Um, he was leading the convoy in a two and a half ton truck with his 50 caliber, of course, on the top. Uh, on the way, to casino, and I'm going to try to show you exactly what happened here by a series of uh, uh, photographs here. ME 109 German fighters, okay, they've all been gassed up, they've all ready to go, and there's two of them taking off, uh, heading and searching for any Fifth Army convoys. We'll go to the next slide. 
And this is the uh, this great picture here, the road to Casino. You can see it's a winding road, and uh, of course, right now, everything's all calm and quiet. And we'll go to the next slide. And some of these pictures are amazing. Th this is uh, two of the ME-109 fighter planes. You can see they just travel the countryside because we really didn't have any uh, air power or artillery set up uh, as we're moving north to uh, for air defense. And uh, the Germans uh, basically had air superiority. And they were just stuck uh, all day long cruising around any open road. There's, of course, many roads leading uh, up to Casino and, of course, up to Rome. And we'll go to the next slide. Now, one of the planes spotted uh, Sergeant Norton's convoy, and he went into a steep dive. It's just almost like this picture right here. And we'll go to the next photograph. And this picture is amazing. It, it <laughs> ME-109 M is strafing run. You can see how low they are. They call it treetop level. And you can imagine being in a convoy and all of a sudden looking up. They, of course, they would try to come out of the sun, which would blind you so you really couldn't see them. Um, they had different tactics. Uh, <clears throat> in some cases, they would just cut their engines and glide with the sun at their back so you wouldn't even hear them. And then when they got down to treetop level, they would gun their engines, start them up, and just hit the convoy and open up with their 50 caliber machine guns. And so here's, this is what, uh, what you would see if you uh, were, were in that convoy. All of a sudden, you see this plane just uh, basically right on top of you. We'll go to the next slide. And my father said that uh, the first pass, everybody's put the trucks on the side of the road, and they all went into the ditch to hide. And he was really getting, getting tired, you know, wanted to protect his men. He was just getting aggravated by all these air raids and everything else. So what he did, he told the truck driver, pull over the side of the road, I'm staying here. And he got up on the seat uh, with the 50 caliber machine gun. And he said he just, on the second pass, the plane came down so low that he actually could see the pilot as it went by. And when it went by right side of him, he just kept on firing at it and firing at it. It was 50 caliber machine gun. He said he uh, shot off the tail of the plane plane started smoking, went over a hill, and crashed. So that's probably the picture that, uh, that he saw. Can you imagine that close, being that close to a um, fighter plane? Now, you go to the next slide, and this shows that ME-109 crashed in the field. Now, he never told me if, uh, of course, they continued on the convoy. He never told me if it uh, blew up or if it just crash-landed or if the pilot got out, so I'll never know that. And he would probably never know it either. And uh, that's, a, that's a true story that uh, the only person he ever told was me. <laughs> uh, we'll go to the next slide. And this picture was sent back to my mother. Now, that was a picture taken in Casino after he shot, he told me that, after he shot down the ME-109. And he's standing, as my father, he's standing on the top, he's got his... Uh, right hand on a 50 caliber machine gun. And we've got to remember, you can't tell anything in your letters when they censor it. <laughs> so I have that letter he sent back, and all he said was, uh, here I am in Italy in your casino. Uh, you can see the mud. Our truck is stuck in the mud, and you can see what we have to go through. That's all he could tell. He couldn't tell her anything else at all. And I didn't find out exactly the significance of this picture, which fortunately I saved um, until many, many years later. So we'll go to the next slide. And from the mountaintop, you can see Mount Casino, and there's a picture there of a German paratrooper. You can see the view. They could see all the movements, everything the Fifth Army had to do. And they would be calling in artillery from the mountainside. And over on the right, you can see Monte Cassino at the top of the hill, uh, and then Castle Hill on the shorter uh, mountain there, and then in the front of it is the town of Cassino. So the Germans had all kinds of observation, and they could just adjust fire for all their artillery. And we'll go to the next slide. And believe me, they had it. Here's the German artillerymen that defend the, the mountaintop. They had all these camouflaged... Uh, any tank guns, any tanks coming up the roads, they could hit. 
we'll go to the next slide. And this is an interesting picture too. This shows the uh, self-propelled artillery. It's a 105 howitzer, but they put it on the track so they could move it around and stop and fire. And you can see all these shell casings down there. And of course the anti-aircraft artillery are the ones that were uh, protecting them. They, they would stop here and then they would set this up and they would uh, fire away in a, on a uh, position and the anti-aircraft artillery would stop, set up their guns and, and try to f shoot down any bombers or planes if they were in the, in the uh, static position right there. And here's a note that he sent back one of his letters. We had a little concert by ourselves, singing the blues away and also to quiet our nerves. You can imagine what they went through all the way up here. Thanks for the face cloths. I put it to good use, taking a sponge bath out of my helmet. Of course, there's no time to take any showers or nothing like that. They, they, they would not go for weeks without taking any showers and stuff. And they would have to take sponge, bashes, sponge baths out of their own helmet. Signed, Sergeant Norton. He couldn't say anything, whether good or bad, any of the, uh, any of the battles that he was in. But that's an actual picture taken at, uh, on the way to Casino. And we'll go to the next picture. And you can see, to soften up Casino, he witnessed this. That's the town of Casino below where the, Mont uh, the Abbey is. And they just called in uh, the U.S. bombers and they just pulverized it. And uh, Casino Town destroyed. That's what they had to do. because They had to get through that town and, and try to get up that mountain. And he writes in his letter here, I have had many more adventures and stories to tell when I got home. Some are funny, some are exciting, and some I will never talk about. I'll just keep to myself. So we'll go to the next slide. And look at that town. They had to go through the town after they pulverized it. We'll go to the next slide. And this picture is uh, incredible going through the town. Look at the devastation. The Fifth Army had to try to get right through that town. Another letter. It would be easy if we could tell what we did every day and what is going on all the time. But that is when the censor comes in to see that we don't say too much about the situation over here, good or bad. If you were saying anything about that, they wouldn't let you let it go through. They would just give it back to you and tear it up. So really, in World War II, the only way you could find out what was going on is read the newspapers. Uh, or uh, the only way they could tell what was going on would be after they're completely out of a compa uh, campaign, then they could probably tell a little bit more in their letters of what happened. For instance, now they're in Italy, so now they could tell a few things about what happened when they uh, conquered Sicily. <laughs> so, but not, not anything that's uh, too dramatic or whatever. We'll go to the next slide. And these pictures, that's in the town of Casino. There's a lull between the action. Those are the actual uh, soldiers right there in the side street. If you look on the side of the building, you can see where it was hit by all kinds of uh, uh, anti-tank artillery or whatever, all the holes in the side of the building there. Sandbags in the front of the tank to somewhat protect the armor. And we'll go to the next slide. And that's another picture in the town of Casino that they went, uh, they went through. And we'll go to another slide. Now, the 5th Army now, <laughs> They had their uh, headquarters. They did not have it at Casino. It was a place called Caserta, Italy. And what Mark Clark did, and of course the British generals, whatever, they occupied uh, the palace. <laughs> and take a look at this palace that they occupied. And there's a picture of the inside there. It was uh, quite a palace here in Caserta, Italy. But from there they could um, uh, meet and conduct uh, all kinds of strategies, uh, both against the um, uh, anything to do with Naples, anything to do with Casino, and we'll go on, of course, with uh, the Anzio invasion. It's all, this is where they did all the planning. 
we'll go to the next slide. And you can see what they had to do to set this up, the communications. There's your telephone communications, uh, 5th Army Headquarters, Caserta, Italy. In the side of the palace there, look at the wiring that had to go in there in the picture on the, uh, on the right. Communication lines from all the different units all across Italy, and they're all centralized here at Caserta. And we'll go to the next slide. And now they're planning a secret amphibious invasion because what happened was they got stuck at Casino and they, 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 they couldn't bust through it. The Germans were so, so entrenched and they just, they, the whole uh, Fifth Army was stuck. So there was a meeting with Winston Churchill, General Mark Clark, and they had come up with this plan here. You can see on the right, and you can see their uh, Anzio, which is uh, next to Casino. And Anzio is 80 miles behind German lines. <laughs> and the whole idea on this plan was they were conduct this plan, amphibious at uh, attack on Anzio to try to break through the casino, so get behind the German lines. And that was going to be, uh, we'll, we'll certainly be talking about that in next uh, next episodes here. Now we'll show you what I have here. This here is a, uh, it's an ammunition belt for uh, M1 rifle, uh, vintage uh, World War II, and all their clips would all go right into the, uh, into here, and this is actual one here. And then they also had this, uh, they would attach to it. Uh, this is a uh, first aid kit, if you wonder if you've seen that on their, uh, they had their first aid kit, uh, bandages and whatever, and they were attached that to these, uh, these belts. And I also have an actual Fifth Army patch that was worn uh, by my father over here. And those are just some items that I just want to talk to you about. And of course, two books here, The Battle for Rome and Monte Cassino, which we discussed here. Um, great reading, and it's a, it's a often, this whole campaign is really, they really don't do any justice covering this uh, in World War II in any in-depth documentary. So we're trying to correct the, uh, this problem here. So once again, it's Dave Norton. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>